morning, everybody. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Calaveras County Planning Commission, and we will get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I believe we may have a staff announcement or not. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Only compliance director. All right. And no agenda changes. None. Then it is time for our general public comment opportunity. Is there any member of the public who is here today to make a general comment not on an item on the agenda today or anybody online? There's no online public comment. Nobody online and it looks like all of you are here for an agenda item. So we'll close the public comment period, move on to the consent agenda, which consists of the minutes of September 12, 2024. Is there any member of the public or the commission who would like to move this from the consent agenda for further discussion? Nope. Is there someone who would like to make a motion on this item? I will move. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 4 1 0. And time for our regular. Four zero one. Hmm? Four zero There's somebody one. missing. Yeah. So four. Four zero one. Yeah. I did them in the wrong order. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Before we go any farther, I should mention I'm going undergoing treatment to get the wax out of my ears. But in the meantime, I am almost deaf. So I really appreciate people <laughs> speaking up. Speaking up. I will, well, yes, I will thanks. Try. <laughs> I will give that my best. <laughs> okay. So regular agenda item one, 2024058. Zoning amendment for agriculture preserve Williamson Act contract 393 submitted by Mark Bolger. And Gina is always our Williamson Act person. <laughs> At least for now. Can you hear me, Tim? Yes, thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, as Michelle just announced, um, we are here today to consider land use application 2024-058 which is a zoning amendment um, to rezone a parcel of land from A1 General Agriculture to AP Agriculture Preserve. Um, California land conservation application from Mark Bolger was received by the county on August 2nd, 2024, proposing to enter 305.41 acres of land into an agriculture preserve and to establish Williamson at contract 63 or excuse me, 363. The subject parcel is comprised of two assessor parcels, um, 521790 and 502327, located off of Hunt Road, approximately 3.7 miles west of the Hunt Road and Highway 4 intersection near Copperopolis. Uh, the California Land Conservation application serves as both an application to establish a Williamson Act contract as well as an agriculture preserve. The application being considered today is to rezone the parcel agriculture preserve um, upon establishment of a Williamson Act contract. Um, my objectives today are to show how the agriculture operation on the subject property qualifies uh, to be in the Williamson Act and how the proposed zoning is consistent with the general plan. Uh, so as we all know, 
Uh, the history of the Williamson Act goes back um, to 1965, when the state of California enacted the California Land Conservation Act um, to preserve agriculture land and open space lands um, for preserving their unnecessary conversion to um, urban uses. The act enables local government to enter into contracts with private landowners for the purpose of restricting specific parcels of land for agriculture and um, agriculturally related open space uses. In doing so, the landowner um, is, the land itself is assessed as agriculture being the highest and best use of the land, resulting in lower taxes for the landowner. Um, Calaveras County established rules to administer agriculture preserves and Williamson Act contracts in the county under Board of Supervisors uh, Resolution 75489. We set forth policies and rules um, in which we still use today. Uh, specific policies and rules applicable to establishment um, of an agriculture preserve and Williamson Act contract are further outlined in my staff report, which I am certain you have all read. Um, first and foremost, the um, agriculture preserve, is if established, must be consistent with the general plan. General plan policy encourages continued participation in the Williamson Act and um, an agriculture preserve, as well as other agricultural-related long-term conservation programs. Um, Important policies, um, this is a very important policy outlined in your resource production element of our general plan. Uh, general plan designates this land as resource production. The resource production land use um, designation identifies lands capable of and primarily used for agriculture. The AP zone is consistent with the resource production land use designation. Located in the Salt Spring Valley, this area of the county is known to support um, its uh, diversity of agricultural operations, uh, including livestock grazing, grapes, and even small orchards. Um, thousands of acres in this area are already in agriculture preserve and also have active Williamson Act contracts in place. This operation um, outlined in this application uh, consists of cattle grazing, the current um, operator has leased this land for two years. Additionally, cattle have grazed this land for many years prior to the current lease. In order to qualify for an agriculture preserve and Williamson Act contract, the land must be capable of producing a minimum of $2,000 annually from commercial agriculture production. Uh, the leasee reported a gross annual income from production of 13500 from his cattle operation. Uh, Scott Onetto, who we all know very well, is our county's um, farm advisor, and he did a conducted a feasibility study on this particular piece of property, finding its capability of producing $54.45 uh, per acre annually. Additionally, an agriculture preserve must consist of not less than 100 acres, which may include um, two or more contiguous parcels totaling 100 acres. Uh, minimum parcel size requirements in the zoning and in the general plan um, for this particular designation is 40 acres. The uh, two assessor parcels together make up one legal parcel totaling 305.41 acres total. On September 12th, the board, the board appointed Agriculture Advisory Committee reviewed this application and determined that it meets the minimum criteria necessary to qualify as and recommended that the Board of Supervisors establish the Agriculture Preserve and Williamson Act contract. In conclusion, general plan policies promote the continued use of land, of land conservation contracts. Application, this application is consistent with the general plan applicable provisions of Title 17. And the proposed operation meets the minimum requirements set forth in Resolution 75489 necessary to establish an agriculture preserve and Williamson Act contract. 
The operation is, uh, is consistent with the surrounding zoning and land use as agriculture is the primary use of land in this area of the county and much of the land as previously noted, is currently in the Agriculture Preserve with active Williamson Act contracts in place. This application is supported by the um, Agriculture Advisory Committee. Um, the project is categorically exempt under CEQA, um, Section 15317. Specific findings um, that the zoning amendment is uh, consistent with the general plan are further outlined in your draft resolution. And in addition, we have um, visitors today. We have Carrie Bassett with our agriculture, um, uh, agriculture Department. Um, Weights and Measures is here on behalf of the Agriculture Advisory Committee. And we also have the applicant, Mr. Mark Bolger, in the event that you have any further questions that have not been addressed in the staff report. With that, concludes my presentation. If you have any questions. One question is, uh, as I understand it, we are on, by the way, I hear myself just fine. <laughs> uh, Good. So I'll just keep talking. Uh, the only thing we're doing today is approving the zoning change. That it's up to the Board of Supervisors right. to approve the, the contract. Right. And so they will have before them the contract and they will make a decision as to whether it meets all the requirements, yes. that sort of thing. So we don't need to go into we don't, guarantees of how it's going to be used and this sort of right. thing, because that's in the contract. But I felt it necessary just so you had an understanding that, oh, yeah. you know, in fact, it is noted that the operation um, is, you know, consistent with establishing, um, you know, criteria set forth in, in county well, yeah, regulation. I think that's very helpful, but I think it's also, we just need to realize right. how limited our decision is. Yes, you are limited Assuming to making a recommendation um, regarding the zoning to the Board of Supervisors, whether or not um, upon establishment of the contract, we should yeah. zone the property appropriately. So we should just, for this, for our purposes, we shall assume that the Board of Supervisors will approve exactly. the contract. So and how it plays out is if we take this forward to the board and for whatever reason, the Board of Supervisors decides not to establish the contract, then it dies and mm -hmm. we don't zone the property, ag, ag preserve, and it goes no further. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else, any questions? Regina, would the applicant like to say anything? Good morning, Commission. Uh, Tim, maybe you can tell me where the microphone is now so I can speak up loud enough. I'm, I don't know what to do here. I speak into the skull? Okay, all right. It's all um, around you. Uh, it's, it, you're, whatever you say will be picked up. Okay, great, great. Um, I don't have anything to add. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions if you guys have any. Obviously, Gina has uh, done a thorough job as, a, as always, so um, I don't have anything additional to put on there. But if you have any questions, I'm here. No. No, None? Thank okay. you. Thank you. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this item? Nobody online. So we're opening the public comment. We're closing the public comment <laughs> and bringing it back to the commission to take a look at the resolution. Are there any grammatical issues with, <laughs> with this resolution? <laughs> I, I have one Go ahead, thing. Tim. <laughs> yeah. One thing just uh, in the under yeah. number two on page two, uh, I think it just ought to spell out L-U-D to what LUD means. Is that it? That's it. Nothing else? Wow. I got nothing. So is there anyone who... Are we ready? We're ready to hear the recommendation. Okay. Staff recommends the Planning Commission adopt Resolution 2024-17, recommending the Board of Supervisors adopt an ordinance amending the zoning of, a, <clears throat> excuse me, of assessor parcel number 050-023-027 and 
052-017-090 from General Agriculture A1 to Agriculture Preserve AP for Mark Bolger's Living Trust upon Bol Board of Supervisors approval to establish Agriculture Preserve and Williamson Act contract 393 for 305.41 acres based uh, based upon the findings included therein. I move we adopt the resolution as amended. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. So the motion passes 401. <laughs> Absent. Thank you. And that was efficient. So we will move on to our second item 2024 022 Zoning Amendment Cultural Resources Management Ordinance. And Peter is going to lead us in understanding this. <laughs> Right, so this is an ordinance proposed to implement uh, general plan implementation measures COS 8H and 8G. Uh, we'll try to do my best here. <laughs> this way. There we go. Is that better? Okay. Um, so the... Um, this was precipitated by a proposal in Valley Springs to uh, demolish an old uh, historic structure, the um, uh, train depot in Valley Springs. Um, the board adopted an urgency ordinance in February uh, that requires a review process um, before a uh, historic structure can be demolished. And if it's found to be significant enough to be protected, then measures could be put in place to protect that structure. Uh, as an urgency ordinance, it was extended after the first 45 day period uh, for a period of one year. So that ordinance will expire in February, February 13th of 2025. Uh, and so the purpose of this ordinance is to put a permanent ordin ordinance in place um, to maintain that program. Um, there have been some changes. We've expanded it somewhat to uh, cover the entirety of, well, almost all of the provisions of um, COS 8H uh, to uh, enable the county to utilize the Mills Act, uh, which is a tax benefit similar to the Williamson Act uh, for protecting historic resources. It also covers alterations to structures, uh, not just demolition, because sometimes uh, structures can be altered to the point where they are no longer um, uh, qualify as being historically significant and they've sort of destroyed the, um, the character of that structure. Uh, case in point would be the, old, the original old schoolhouse in Murphy's that was um, sold by the Veterans um, District to a private party who then converted it to a, um, a vacation rental and um, did significant modifications to that structure so it no longer really carries the historic significance that used to be there. So um, primarily we've taken um, the urgency ordinance, worked with that as a base and um, modified it where we thought it was appropriate in order to um, incorporate these other provisions. Uh, we've referenced the um, uh, Department of Interior, Secretary of Interior standards for uh, how you handle the, you know, the modifications to a structure, which was one of the provisions of the general plan. Uh, we have um, added reference to the Mills Act so that the um, assessor can utilize that uh, in um, providing tax breaks for uh, qualifying structures and sites. Um, and I, I think probably the best thing to do is just sort of go through. I know that uh, Commissioner Laddish has uh, provided some suggested edits. There's a couple of other modifications that um, County Council and I would like to propose as well. Um, it's obviously within the scope of the general plan since we are um, implementing that provision. Uh, we have found that it is a, um, a later project under um, 
the general plan EIR and have not prepared any subsequent environmental document because of that. Also found that it is exempt under certain provisions of the CEQA guidelines in addition to that. Um, just, So I guess with that, I'll turn it back over to the commission and we can sort of go through any proposed edits or any concerns you have in general over the whole purpose of the ordinance, if that is a concern of any members. I have a list of sort of general areas. I think maybe it might be helpful to kind of approach it in, instead of looking at specific edits. There's tremendous overlap between Commissioner Lattish's comments and the areas I'm talking about, but I thought maybe that way we could, you could help clarify and Julie could help, public can chime in to see if just conceptually we're all in agreement before we spend a lot of time editing something that we're not even thinking that's the direction we're gonna I go. I understand that, now, that's a great suggestion. And I do think it's very important that uh, we have the public here, <laughs> is our two experts in this field, um, I would, is there a way to have them be part of a general conversation? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. Let them yeah. chime in in each area, uh, if applicable, uh, or we can kind of get through and then let them come back and ex they might be able to add. Well, do you want me then to just sort of walk through the various sections of the proposed ordinance and sort of explain the intent behind that? Uh, and then as we go through each section, you can say, oh, you know, here are some concerns I have, or how, how would you like to do that? I think maybe if I give you the area, it's gonna kind of follow your and Julie's memo. Okay. The, like the very first thing that I, I thought of was, do we all agree that the appropriate level of expansion to the urgency ordinance is to include alterations, but should we, look at how about what is relocation is relocation an alteration or should it also be mentioned um, because it might provide the opportunity for a building to be preserved even if it it would be difficult to preserve it in its existing location or that there might be an unwilling landowner um, and also do we want to clarify that the conditions could address interior and exterior alterations or demolition? And do we want to include associated landscapes, like if you have uh, improvements directly around a structure like historic gardens? sheds, other things associated with the primary structure, should they be included? So I, it, the, to me, that's all pretty conceptual, but okay. so does any commissioner have a thought on any of that? Well, I, I think as far as uh, exterior versus interior, um, I think, and I, I will be interested in the comments from, from the floor, um, I think that it's a key consideration in several respects. Number one, what will be included uh, in this list? Um, as far as uh, under subsection B, applicability. Um, if the interior needs to be historically intact, we're gonna very much limit the number of buildings and structures that will qualify for the list. I don't know. I don't know of any hundred-year-old building where the kitchen hasn't been redone, or probably any seventy-five-year-old building where the kitchen hasn't uh, been redone. You're talking about two different things, I think. One is what eligibility, and one is what our conditions might address. Well, no, I know, but I think then, then when you move to, you know, if if we limit the eligibility to exterior, not interior, um, then when we look at how to address it, why if we have a lot less uh, intrusion into the owner's uh, uh, 
capabilities of, of living comfortably if we do not include the interior as part of, I mean, if, if we certainly need to have alterations covered since, as you point out, all, a, a building can basically be de demolished except for one post or something and call it an alteration. But uh, if we limit our consideration for the list to exterior, why, number one, more, more buildings will be covered and there'll be less intrusion in the review. I, I, I think there's a big confusion here. They're eligible based on the, the federal and state guidelines, period. Well, not. That, and we can, have, we can have different eligibility for a local registry, but they are, the eligibility guidelines don't say the interior has to be intact in order to, for it to be eligible. It may or it may not be. Can well, I can I try to yeah, clarify? Let's, I think what I think what Commissioner Plotnick is suggesting, obviously this is all a policy decision yeah. on your point, is the the proposal that staff has is to base eligibility off of the baseline eligibility for what would require CEQA consideration. However, and I think then what the question now is, is once something, and that's also a policy okay. decision, you could choose to make things eligible that go beyond what CEQA requires at the local level, but staff is proposing to have eligibility based on whether you're already on a st state or federal list and then there might be other criteria for CEQA that if you meet it we would create a local list okay separately from that once once something is eligible hold on hold on once mm -hmm. something is eligible you the you have you can also decide what conditions of approval to put on it which could go beyond what CEQA would require to mitigate and in which case you could add interior renovations. That's what I think the proposal is. Mind you, it's all a policy call. CEQA doesn't cover interior changes to buildings, but as a administrative or conditional use permit, the county can. And if you read through the requirements that it seems like if a building is very significant, then it might be appropriate to try to retain some interior elements that create the character of the building without entirely limiting things. But I just think we're not saying anything about interior or exterior. That's my point. It's just, should we just say that, um, that this either applies only to the exterior period or exterior and could apply to interior elements. No. I think this whole thing is overbroad. I mean, what's the definition of a structure? Um, we're talking about a fence, a little shed, big building, a house. Well, we're talking when about you read the houses? eligibility, you'll see that a fence probably wouldn't um, okay. comply unless um, it was a, a really mean, super specific garden wall designed by a very famous landscape architect that has remained pristine for and was associated with uh, you know General Washington <laughs> was there. I mean it's the eligibility requirements limit a lot of that. What about a rock fence? A rock wall could be a a cultural so, resource, so but gonna, I don't think it's covered here. Rock so, so here's let me just help. I, I don't. I know you said you didn't have time to go through some of the, the attorney-client privilege memo. So, some of some every time we have a discretionary project, we're going to have to look at cultural and historical resources. And under CEQA, they tell us the things we have to look at, and it's tied to, and it can be. Um, something that there's a location where somebody important died and it might not have a structure on it. There's, there's a ready state law telling us what we have to look at as far as what counts as a resource. As if a count, it's a discretionary If it's time. a discretionary project, which is a type of project that would go to the planning commissioner to planning. Separately from that, the county can always add more and be stricter. 
So this is where I have a question. So this, right. So this ordinance, if we didn't have any ordinance, we'd still have to do CEQA on discretionary projects. So this ordinance is an attempt to sort of standardize the process for reviewing historical resources. And this, the staff proposal is to keep eligibility the exact same as state law without going stricter. The count, now the question is whether or not as a policy preference, the commission and board want to be stricter and want to do this in the form of a standardized ordinance. And if so, whether the things we're doing to standardize it are adequate on a policy level. That's sort of in now, a nutshell where we are. Let, let me break in because uh, if, if we look at, at subsection B, um, this chapter applies to buildings or structures that are, and then A is the National Register or California Register. B has been determined to be eligible uh, with an or in between those two. Mm -hmm. Now, was the, was the staff suggesting that, that there should be an and after B? I mean, there, the C has local criteria in it. So I, I thought it's that it was more. that there was an independent determination by, by it, it should have, there should have been an or, or in there. Should have been yeah. or. A, B, or C. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if it's or, well then th th those are local specifications that are to be applied as to be on the list. So there could be things on our list that are not on or eligible for the, the so I have that as list. a whole separate section for us to discuss what we what we would well, allow on ours the question is does the entire thing want to apply to so demolition was the urgency ordinance the proposed ordinance is demolition and alterations so should relocation also be something that is looked at or are they just allowed to say, I'm preserving it, I'm moving it somewhere. Nobody needs to look at this any further. Or, or do we want to say relocation will be considered to be an alteration? For well, e of this? Either way, we just need to define it yeah. somehow if, that's, if we want to cover it. So that's the question for all of us. And then do we want to clarify that we're really only going to discuss exterior visible from the exterior items and how much of the surrounding area directly associated with the building, if it is intact, would we consider to also be protected or eligible? We, we are talking about private property, right? We are talking about, well, so we're talking we're about private and government. we're gonna micromanage people's private property who happens to own something that's 75, 76 years old. No, not necessarily. Pretty much what you're saying. No, we say that. You're talking so, about fences so and gardens I, now. Potentially, they would have to meet that eligibility requirement. So they would have to have been determined to be significant. So a 75 year old, 78 year old house or 80 year old house, that there are 40 of them that are similar and nobody famous ever lived there. Nobody that? famous designed the them or built them. No historic event occurred there. There's not, they're gonna take that first off ramp and they're not gonna be. Who determines that? That's the that's, uh, well, committee established or the uh, review body, which is the planning director, the building official, and a representative from the historical society. So it's just another step, another, another thing you got to do to be about. Right. So what I think is important is some of this we ha you have to yeah. do because state law says so. Yeah. Right. Um, some of this you have to do because the general plan, we committed to it. And then there's the rest, which is what we have discretion over. Well, it seems it's like important so to keep in mind that the, the general plan only covered demolition. Demolition no, no, the general plan does cover Historic multi. resources, COS 8G covers demolition, not alteration. That's what the board passed was... The no, that was the urgency to stop, ordinance. Right, to stop demolition. So, and we've added alteration, which the board, that's 
why didn't they put an alteration? They just they just wanted to stop the demolition of the Valley Springs Depot. Now we're going to extend that to the entire county. It's in COS 8G. Mm -hmm. And it's, it requires a cultural resource study before any building 75 years or older can be demolished. So that's the why is that if you have a discretionary approval and you want to develop a property that has something on the state or federal list, CEQA is going to already require you to mitigate that resource. CEQA will require that before you can get your project approved. The why, other, the why other, did the board bother passing this resolution? Yeah, the other why is because the other why is we have a general plan where we committed as mitigation for our general plan EIR to do the cultural resource study on these places and to sort of standardize how we're going to go about the review. So that's something the county already committed to. And then the reason why the board passed an urgency ordinance is because there was a proposal to demolish a structure before we had time to implement the general plan. And they didn't want to extend it beyond demolition into alteration at that time because the issue was demolition of a building. Right. The board, I think, I can't be sure, is aware that it has a general plan obligation for the permanent ordinance, which is subject to much more public vetting, to... It, to do this piece. So we did already, the county and the board already committed to doing what we're doing here today. As to demolition. And, and, and I want to no. add something demolition. to it. The what's, reason what's, what's, that, that we're doing it is also to provide a benefit because there were people in the development community who wanted the possibility of using the Mills Act to get a tax break on their historic properties in return for preserving them. Without this ordinance, they don't get to use the Mills Act. They also would like to have the opportunity to have a local registry, which would allow access to the historic building code, which allows much more flexibility and compliance with the building code. So there are benefits to being a listed property or building. I that's yeah, that's fine if you want to be listed. If you don't want to be listed, well, we're going to that. that, we're gonna get to that. That's another question. We're going to get to that, but the, but there is there are going to be properties, which admittedly will likely be few, in which they could be compelled to do some preservation work against their will. For the most part, it will probably be people who are interested in doing this in order to get those benefits. Yeah, I, 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 I don't, we're not some fast growing county where historical buildings are on the verge of being taken over by subdivisions. I think most people want to preserve their historical buildings in the, as much as they can. I think, I just, I don't like putting more steps in it. So by state law, if your building is over 75 years old, it's going to get looked at when you submit for any kind of building permit to alter, demolish, relocate, do whatever with it. That somebody is going to make a determination at that. that. We're required to do that now. Are we doing that now? We have not been consistent in my experience with doing that. But well, <laughs> the, 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 but in adopting the general plan, we, the county, yes, we the board already committed to implementing some sort of cultural resource ordinance that meets at the very minimum state law requirements. The board wanted to put off the full implementation at the time the railroad depot um, project came around. This was all in the stuff I sent you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe let's back up. And maybe I started with the wrong thing, even though it was sort of at the front of the ordinance. Maybe what we want to look at is, is the process. It seems like we need a process that says the first thing that happens is the building department gets an, an application and the building is more than 75 years old. It goes to Peter. To the planning department, maybe not Peter, <laughs> to the planning department. Somebody there looks and says, is it or isn't it over 75 years old? Is it or isn't it significant? There are many, many buildings that are obviously not significant. There's nothing about them that is going to make them special. But, or does it require further investigation to determine 
if there's any significance to it. And then if it is significant, is, is it eligible to be listed on a historic, yeah. or is it already listed on a, somebody's historic register, either the state or the feds? Somebody has already agreed to it. So, and then, or, and if it's not already listed, is it gonna be our determination that it should be listed on a local register? And then what are the requirements of that going to be? So if it gets listed, then you have to look at what, what um, condition is the building in? Has it been changed so much that it doesn't matter? So now it's off the next off ramp, it, you know, it's lost. Or it's deteriorated and beyond the point where it would be feasible to reconstruct it or to preserve any pieces of it. Now it's off again. So now you're down to a very small subset of properties that would get listed or are already listed, and then they would have need a CUP. Well, depending on what it is. So let's say they're getting a new roof. Maybe we have a process that's an AUP for very minor things that are, and they get to do that without going through the whole CUP process for in front of the public. I'm making this up. This is what we're gonna to try to determine today. And then the next, so it is, let's say it is a significant building. It has historical figures associated with it. It's still mostly there. Then there's all these different levels of preservation, restoration, reconstruction, rehabilitation for a new use that you can look at and condition the project to have certain requirements if they, and then they will be able to do all use the tax incentives apply for other benefits from the feds for preserving a historic building and use the historic building code so it's not that every building 75 years or older or every fence that's 75 years or older is going to have any conditions on it okay i have one comment on that on, on your summary is that the way the ordinance draft exists, the list gets established. And then when the building officer refers uh, a, a permit application to the planning director, it, the planning director's determination is whether it is a listed building. So that it, 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 it it sounds like no, quite, no, well, no. And if I can address that, yeah. and, and I That's see how, how you can interpret it that way. That was not the intent. Okay. And, and I've, I have some language I'll propose Good. that would say that it only becomes listed at the point that we review a proposal right. or if someone comes to us and says, I want to have my, my building listed. That's, my that's great listed. because uh, this, I mean, We'd have to hire several more planning directors to go out. And I have the that, that on mine too. So it's yeah. either already listed by somebody or somebody opts in. They just want to get their project listed or it comes to us and we determine that it's necessary. There's a to proposal to demolish or alter yeah. and we can add relocation. Yeah. Yeah. A simple change is add relocation. I think that makes sense. It probably already qualifies under alteration, yeah. but just so it's yeah. clear, you know, because where it might be moved to could have a significant uh, impact on the historic character of that. And um, I think, to be realistic, I really think we're not going to be voting on this today, but I think this is a great discussion. And I think we'll have to continue it to see, you know, what, what so I proposed have amendments. Let, let's I'm cross that bridge when we get I'm to the end of, sure. of our discussion. Write an item and see if we can get general agreement on it. Sure. Should our local registry be a combination of a compilation of already listed pro um, properties, the option for somebody to opt in, a landowner, to come to us and ask to be listed on that registry to give them access to these other benefits, or a project that has been through the process and determined to be a significant cultural resource. That we're, that as opposed to we go out and try to identify all the buildings that should be protected right, right. and put them on a registry. So 
Do we all agree that we want to go with the first description, which is, I think, what Peter was trying to actually describe? Which would, we'd have to put these, uh, the, the local qualification provisions might be somewhere else then, as far as. Uh, the local qualification the, provisions could be exactly the <clears throat> same as they are for the federal and state and we could add to them in the future, but I would suggest that simplicity might be the winner today and that we would stick with what is already determined to be uh, I would suggest that, criteria. that the chair's or the, um, suggestion that we sort of look at the broad picture, not get into the weeds yes. of, of mm -hmm. how we're gonna wordsmith yeah. that, but yes, do we have a consensus that that's the approach we wanna take makes sense and yeah. so and i, and I, I think um, what what the chair has described makes a lot of sense because uh, i was having real problems with the planning director just saying that one and that one and that so one. would i okay <laughs> i thought so uh, without any notice to the person mm -hmm. involved yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So should have done that one this, first this <laughs> is, my list is out of order <laughs> this i mean the, the order that you're suggesting i think is very good because when the when the permit, I mean, you still, the planning director would still see every building permit and have to make a decision. Yeah, um, planning reviews every building permit. Oh, um, okay. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, okay. Now, is it consistent with zoning? Is okay. one of the criteria we have to, to yeah, review? Yeah. And so this would okay. add a, an additional review checklist thing and we've got a long list of things we look at does it meet setbacks is it height requirements and meet the, the standards of the zoning is it a permitted use etc 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 one other thing we would now, now be looking at would be is it the, the, 75 years or older or already on an historic list yeah, right. and if it is 75 years or older These does things. it meet the criteria yeah. in bc um, and if it does, then it kicks it over to the review process that uh, Michelle had um, described. Not and very eloquently. Uh, I did <laughs> <a> good job. <laughs> and there are many opportunities for to say, no, we don't need to worry about it. May I suggest we ask for any input? From... I'm going to do that next. Just so we all when we stop well, talking. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, for this, for this, at yes, this stage. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I had proposed. So, yeah. but Peter, are you finished with your thought? Yes, and maybe we can go through sort of those global issues, um, identify what those are. I think um, uh, Ms. Broby has uh, concerns about alteration, you know, and not just uh, demolition. Um, and so as a group, you can decide we want to go down this path or no, we want to limit it to I, just- I, I don't want to. I don't want this, and well, none of us want this to get to the point where it actually is counterproductive, where you've got a, right. a beautiful historic building and people are trying to improve the inside and we're putting you know, more steps to the point where like, eh. Well, exactly. well, and also we don't want to exactly. get to the point where the people are gonna say, I'm just, I'm just not gonna apply for a building right now. Exactly. Yeah. Where's that to? Um, so, so I could, could have actually trained people, sorry. Sure, um, go ahead. That was a, Inexpensively built building when it was built. I don't know how old is it? Do we know? Probably 100 years. Easily. Maybe more. More. Probably, is, yeah, whenever that trains were brought to. falling apart. It's going to, mm -hmm. if you keep the outside character and don't demolish it, it's going to take a lot of work and money to get that thing to where it's. I don't know if it's even structurally sound. I well, and those are some of the considerations yes. why the building official is involved in the review. Safety could be a concern. Yeah. Um, it is on the state historic list. So, right. so oh, okay. it's already, already a listed yeah. building. Yeah. That's what brought the whole thing up. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. I, I, I saw, I've read the, the, the statute about the, the state list. I haven't seen anything as far as state requirements as far as destruction, et cetera. I it's, believe they reference the same, but actually, let, let's invite yes. Julia or Judy, would one we of can, you guys like to come on up here? Can you repeat that question? Sometimes I tend to ask a question and 
Yeah, so he's asking about, is the California registry requirements different than the federal? Well, and, and, and I've seen the requirements for inclusion. I haven't seen anything resulting from that. What, what are the restrictions, et cetera, by being on the state list? Essentially, our state CEQA requirements were made to match the federal requirements. We have so much federal land in California, and they overlap on so many projects where a state project has federal funding that they made them the same. So in most documents, you'll see this complies with CEQA and NEPA. And but, we just, so they're the same, essentially. But what, I mean, but what's the significance of being on the state registry or the federal registry as far as what the state or federal law will permit. I mean, what's, what, the what's, the, what's the effect of being on the register of the historic registry? Your, uh, your um, essentially things essentially. like the Mills Act are available, the yeah. historic building code. Often there's just local prestige. People want to be on the register. Right. There used to be grants. Mm -hmm. There used to be commercial grants, mm -hmm. grants for commercial properties. There's still tax incentives. Um, that Jim Hildreth could be taking advantage uh -huh. of on Main Street San Andreas if, if we'd had that in place. But there are no specific, I mean, CEQA would apply, but there's no specific requirements that are added by being on the historic resources list as far as development or change or this sort of thing. There's no particular advantage in being on? Is no, that, no, he, no. He's wondering if it matters. So if you're listed on the National Register and not on the California, or you're, regi or you're listed on California but not on the National Register, I think if, the if, if you're, if you're on, the on the National Register, you might not be able to access the federal tax credits and some of those programs. And there used to be a Main they, Street there's, program. They're so coincidental that once you get put on the California Register, you pretty much get on the National Register. I but, think by default, but, if you're on the yeah. National, you are on the California, if I recall. Well, yes, and if you're on the National Register, you're on the California. Yeah. They've uh, just melded them. Okay, it's, it's, here we're saying, if you're on any of these lists, we have some real developmental loop, uh, hoops you have to jump through. That's what mm -hmm. I didn't see in the state law, that there was any provisions in state law saying, oh, if you're on our list, uh, you, you get these benefits, but do you have, also have obligations or you, you are restricted from changing the property and affecting its history? Right. What, what CEQA requires is a study. So if you have a project going in, you have to look and see, are any properties within that project eligible for CEQA, for the National Register or the State Register? If, so, if there's a yes, then they say, does the project have any negative impacts? If it has negative impacts on a listed property, then you have to mitigate. You have to propose yeah. mitigation and measures. that's all under CEQA? Mm -hmm. That's all in CEQA. Okay. Yeah, so then you proceed with mitigation. Or can be NEPA, in, if it's on federal yeah. land. Yeah. Or NEPA, if it's on and federal land. So I think the difference here, I just want to clarify that um, by being on the state or federal list and a discretionary project is proposed, you must mitigate mm -hmm. if there is an impact. Okay. Um, this extends that to the local level to non-discretionary actions of the county, approval of a building permit to demolish or alter. Um, that's what this would do. So it, it, it requires us then to look at it, not necessarily through the CEQA lens because it's not a discretionary project and it's not subject to CEQA, unless we make it so, and this ordinance says this would require a limited scope analysis just on the historic aspect yeah. of the proposal for yeah. ministerial type actions, and given the where otherwise it wouldn't apply. Given the procedures we were discussing before as far as what needs to be changed in here, um, it all is making a lot more sense. The, one major question we have, one major question we have still is exterior and interior. We, can we address that? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Do you want to address it? it, it go ahead. The, the register simply says the exterior 
is significant. If the interior is wonderful, like Monticello, that is it also applies to that interior. But normally, it's just the exterior, unless the interior is wonderful. Okay. Right. And essentially, in the significant statement for the property, it basically just talks about the exterior. If there's some fabulous landscaping around mm -hmm. it, that is the period and the owners built it and it's 200 years old, that could be part of the significant statement and then might also be included as a significant aspect of the building and therefore need mitigation if someone's gonna put a parking lot. So I just need to clarify that for CEQA purposes, mm -hmm. there's a whole bunch of case law that interior renovation is not right. a physical effect on the environment and CEQA, right. It will not, if that is the only thing at issue, SQL will not be triggered. So again, anything we require for interior, they're correct about the outside and how much of the site and how much of the exterior of the property would be contained. But it would be a county policy decision to add interior. So I want to be clear. I wasn't suggesting we add interior. I was suggesting we clarify it. Yes. That, that was all. Right. <laughs> so to make it in keeping with the requirements. And I think it, from what all has been said, if we keep this narrowly focused on building their structures, which is what these permit uh, applications would be, um, CEQA is going to take care of the landscape, right? I mean, that, well, we're I still- Well, I think we should say the associated landscape. So yeah. the, let me, again, some of the intent of the drafters mm -hmm. of this ordinance was this. Okay, we the general plan speaks to demolition permits. CEQA speaks to discretionary permits. We're going to have to review both because of the combination of CEQA and our general plan commitments. The goal here, and it doesn't have to be followed, the goal for, by staff was to try to have a uniform way of looking at the impacts regardless of whether the permit that came in was a demo, a ministerial demo permit, or whether it was a discretionary permit. And instead of requiring the developer to separately hire archaeologists or experts, the panel review would be a, a cheaper and possibly more flexible option because of the people who are on it for the whole kit and caboodle. When CEQA does apply to a project, you do have to, or even if, we, if we're saying it's going to apply to a demo, we are required based on the standards to mm -hmm. look at not just the structure, right. but the other exterior site. So we can't, if, if we were to just limit this ordinance to the structure, we would then have to do a separate CEQA process, which would be duplicative for how much of the grounds, how much of the outbuildings. So the goal here was to try to be efficient and have a uniform process for all of it. And, and so the CEQA piece on the discretionary project would be including the having the panel consider not just the exterior structure, but how much of the site around it needs to also be protected because CEQA would require us to look at that. Um. You speak of outbuildings. I'm assuming the outbuildings are buildings or structures under this uh, under this ordinance. I mean, barns would be protected. Bil it's, buildings it's are about, defined in the zoning code, and this would be part of the zoning code. Is any structure having a roof supported by columns or walls and intended for the shelter, housing, or enclosure of persons, animals, or property of any kind? So yes, a shed would be a building. So you would, have a church. Would potentially Wait, be anyway, subject to, to be, You have a but church, to be and the church is a structure. But the st let's say that the most historic part of the whole thing is who's buried in the churchyard around it. The whole thing in context is the resource. And so 
once you have the trigger through some sort of structure, you then have to look at what constitutes the significant section of the site, not the interior, but the exterior site, including the ground, including a landmark, including outbuildings. And if you have a 40 acre property, you have to figure out what portion of that property is within the protected zone. That would all be required under CEQA. Okay, now, assuming you have a parcel where a hundred year old house had been torn down um, years ago, um, and but you still have the barn, that barn would be subject to our review, correct? It would be if yes, it was a historic. Only if they came it, in to get a permit yeah, right. unless it was already right. listed on right. another register. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the chances that the people who have their 400 acres and have an old barn that they are letting fall to the ground, which breaks my heart. Yeah. But I don't think we're in a position no. to do anything about. No, but if and permit, I don't think we would want to try to put ourselves in a position. But if, <laughs> if a permit were requested, for yes uh, i'm going to add another uh stable onto this barn uh, that would fall under this statute yes. even if the, it, the it, house could. it could it could yeah After and and we would look at that as you know, how significant is that barn is it one of yeah. hundreds of barns in the county that are built the same time period is, or is there something so unique this house the horse of Joaquin Murrieta used yes. or something like that. You know? <laughs> but, but that would be that would be what the panel would be looking at. Yes. Right. Once yes. you would determine, well, it's right. more right. than 75 years you old. Hit the trigger. And now we look at it. Yeah. Right. Making a lot of sense to me. Okay. I don't know, Mike, how are you? I'm, yeah. I'm warming up to it. <laughs> <laughs> we knew you would. <laughs> could I have a question here that's just germane to this topic? Sure. Although we could hold everything to the end. But one of our questions was um, that the general plan, the county's general plan, defines uh, cultural resources as including prehistoric sites, archaeological sites, mining remains, landscape features, corrals, ditches, all these things. Um, and so our ultimate question is, are we, is this ordinance to cover all cultural resources or only buildings and structures? Because some of these cultural resources, non-buildings and structures, are already listed on the National Register and are on that compiled list. For instance, our Chinatown Gardens in Moak Hill is, a, um, is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, the Romaji store on Highway 49 is a ruin, and that's on the National Register. Um, there is a number of prehistoric sites on the Highway 4 wagon trail, which we've all heard about, <laughs> and they have been determined eligible for the register. So is our ordinance going to encompass all the um, cultural resources in the county? I don't think that was the intent. Although well, this we was specifically that... to address historic resources, historic structures. Um, there are a lot of other provisions that address, you know, through CEQA, the other cultural resources. Um, but it's not something that a building permit would necessarily address. Um, well, then I think, I mean, your building permit is one thing. They're not yeah. going to apply for a modification to the archaeological site. Yeah. Right, right. But right. Um, your um, advisory committee and your California Register of Historic Resources, is this going to encompass all the county's cultural resources, or is the register only going to be buildings and structures? The register could include all resources. Okay. Just yes. so there would be a single source to check yes. right. something. Yeah. I, and that yeah. would make sense. And then also, I mean, to think about that your advisory committee would advise on the whole range of cultural resources. It, it could. I, you know, the, the, I want to call it advisory committee because it's, a, it's just a panel to review proposed building permits for, dem, for alteration yeah, or... Let's call it a review panel. Okay. Review panel. Right. Um, Which could be our staff or could be an outside person yeah. if needed. And, and the... Well, it would include... Yeah. staff and an outside mm -hmm. person with uh, expertise on cultural or historic resources. Okay. The Board of Supervisors would have to separately, we're implementing the general plan here and the panel was not really meant to be an advisory committee to the board for future policy. It was really meant to review just the individual applications in lieu of having to hire a whole bunch of other experts to satisfy CEQA. 
it would be the board of supervisors that would have to separately decide as a policy matter whether they want an advisory committee for future policy to do with. And, and I think we're, we're, again, we're sort of <laughs> yeah. combining the CEQA process with this internal review process for non-discretionary mm -hmm. um, permits. Um, and I have to sort of differ with Julie's statement earlier about that we wouldn't necessarily have to hire a, a you know, professional uh, for CEQA related projects because even though this panel would look at it, I certainly don't have the expertise to determine whether or not that specific building or site has the you know, level of importance that needs to be raised to, um, to being listed. That's why we have someone from the Historic Society on that panel. But for a development project, we would probably still require that they hire a consultant, uh, mm -hmm. archaeologist or historian or whoever, to look at the cultural resources aspect of that. If there was something. If there was something there. Well, and to determine if there's anything significant there, someone would have to walk the site to see are there, you know, potential middens, you know, what's, what structures oh, are there. archaeological stuff. Yeah. 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 The way I read the ordinance as drafted, it didn't encompass surrounding areas. It was just the building or structure. Well, we said yeah. parcel. Well, and I was... And that's the reason why we chose parcel was because it was, was intended was, to look at a, more than just the... The building and the immediate context that the building mm -hmm. is but, located in. But since the, the draft seemed to contemplate the establishment of this list to, before we get into yeah, and, the, and that I know, yeah. I know that that's going to be taken care of, <laughs> but the... Uh, the language in the review portion does uh, uh, I'm trying to find okay that 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 had the parcel language on it, and i was I didn't understand why we did that, but when we get to that, what we need to talk about okay um, because. You know, it seemed to me we were talking about buildings or structures. So, um, uh, it's, we have to have a very clear demarcation as to exactly, I mean, everything, it's clear that everything goes to the planning director as far as every uh, application for a building permit or demolition. We have to make it very clear exactly what the, Planning, the planning director's decision is to trigger this review panel. That, that's okay. essential. Yeah. And in that, that it is seems, potentially eligible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that, and that whole, well, yes, it is who's deciding whether it's going to be on the list. I mean, the way we've got the procedure going now, it's the list is not independently uh, established before this process starts, it's added to um, as applications are received. Uh, so it just has to be very, very clear, uh, which I don't think it, it is yet, uh, as far as what the decision of the planning director is that triggers the, it's, if the planning director says, this is not subject to review under this ordinance, then the building officer sails on on the usual yeah. path. Right, yes. right. And so you have these basically three or two stages of going to the planning director. The planning director makes some decision that either triggers the review panel or gets tossed back to the to the uh, uh, building official. And it's just necessary we get this very clear exactly what that decision is and what involvement the property owner has in the making of that decision. Um, that uh, it, it appears to me from the state statute that if the owner objects, 
it isn't on the list. It's not on the state list. It is on the eligible list if it would otherwise qualify. Correct. Um, yes. And that's, we, we would be including not only what's on the list, but what's eligible to be on the right. national and state list. And uh, for some purposes, that would benefit the property owner in that if it's on our list, then the Mills Act would seem to apply. Right, um, right, right. Although there's a but, whole but, lot to that, too. Oh, yes. But if by, <laughs> by having people that are just eligible under the state law uh, being on our list, we're in some ways being inconsistent with state law. No, I don't think so, because no. state law doesn't directly address what happens once you're on the list. That is up to the local jurisdictions of do we approve a permit? Do we allow it to be demolished? Uh, that has been except for CEQA. Yes. So if it's a discretionary project up to CEQA, then there are requirements. But but if, I, I would like to ask our experts here, uh, what difference does it make under CEQA whether something is either on the state list or eligible for the state list? There's no difference. If There's it's no determined difference. eligible, it's eligible. <laughs> okay. It's a technicality. But, but yeah. if, if something could have been determined to be eligible and the landowner has to, they can expressly object to being listed, and yeah. then they cannot be listed. But Nobody. they can still be listed as eligible. As eligible. Right, and that, that listing is in the um, California Register of Historic Resources. So that's a list that's published, it's online, mm -hmm. and if an owner says, I don't want my property to appear in that list, then it isn't, but he still has an eligible property, and he's still subject to the same. Um, the Planning thing. departments okay. consider impacts, negative impacts, and mitigation. Thank you. But he doesn't get the gold star next to his right. name. Yeah. Right. right. Well, so we're going to assume that we have, we're going to have always have a professional planning director. I'm not being facetious. <laughs> um, but then we've got this uh, mystery board that. No, it's described in there. The three panel. It's the building oh, the panel, official. The, the planning. panel. Uh, what's the appeal process to, if to that happens? To you, the planning commission. Yes. And ultimately yes. the board. So <laughs> even my determination that the first step, this structure is 75 years or older. Um, and and, and, the other and that can be appealed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the panel's decision, um, as I recall, we the panel will come up with recommendations mm -hmm. of how this project could move forward. Um, maybe there are minor tweaks in the architecture that would retain the character of the building. Um, that then comes to the planning commission for a decision. So it's not a final decision by the panel, it's a recommendation. And our decision can be appealed to the Board, to the board of Supervisors. supervisors yeah. I wonder though, the, if it's just a determination whether the, the building or structure is 75 years old, that's easy. No, um, not necessarily. <laughs> well, okay. That's yeah, you would know. <laughs> okay. Um, it, at what point does the, the, I mean, we have in the, in the draft here, the way I read it, was the planning director decides something's on the list, forget whether there's been a permit or not requested. No. And that decision uh, is appealable to the, I'm, I'm looking at the. Well, some things are either already listed or eligible and listed it as eligible somewhere yeah. else. There's really nothing to appeal there. It's either they're on those lists or not, but a determination by the planning director and a recommendation by the panel that something should be eligible mm -hmm. That could be appealed. Right. Well, that, but and, and I think what you had stated just recently was, was that the decision that the planning director would first make a decision before we went to the review panel 
and that that decision was going to be appealable. And I'm not sure mm -hmm. that that's, uh, I think maybe what you're saying is makes more sense, that the planning director says, I think I should refer this to the review panel to make a determination as to whether or not, not only whether it's a historic structure under the standards set for applicability, but uh, then what? What would, what would this permit, if, if granted, what would it do and what would the... Anyhow, I think all that might be something that's, that's subject to the review, because otherwise it it's, it's not... Well, it, it has you to, could, it has you could determine mature. that a building was or was 75 years old initially, the initial construction, but it may have been so yeah. seriously remodeled 50 years ago that there really, you can't tell that it was a 80 year old building. It, there's just nothing left of the original building. I, I think then the planning director could say, well, this one's already off. There's no chance that it will be found to be an eligible resource because there's just nothing left of the original resource. But, uh, well, yeah, and that's why I was adding language that is, have not been altered in a manner that substantially diminishes the historic significance of the resource as part of that's the That's already in the, the definitions, though. Yeah, I'd like ahead, to say Jean. something. Oh, the criteria. It has to meet certain criteria, and that's either the Cal Register or the National Register. But a building could meet all four of those criteria and still not be eligible if it has no integrity. So you need what you usually set out are thresholds of significance. So you note that every 75-year-old building you have to look at. That, and so if you just have your thresholds all written down already, does it meet this criteria, this criteria, this criteria, this criteria? It doesn't meet any of them. And it's all got aluminum windows and it's new yeah. siding. Yeah. It's out of there. Right. So, so those criteria, do you think, should be in the ordinance? No, we can, can refer the, to them. They already exist. Well, yeah. it, it would be handy to have your um, thresholds of importance. It's a standard thing, the thresholds of importance defined, because then it would make it much easier on the planning director right. to not have to scrutinize every single one well, and but integrity list. should be called out in the ordinate you know when you're listing a b c d of the criteria add integrity it's always there um, as another thing it would just if you put it in there then it makes it a and, solid and you're speaking of structural integrity is it going to fall down architectural integrity integrity has pages oh, written okay, on it okay. but it allows that to be a factor in determining um besides the ABCD. Just under the list that says it's associated with a, it, it's this age, it's associated with a historical figure, blah, 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 blah. In that list, just add integrity to the. ABCD integrity. Yeah. Right. That's the I one that should be added there. Right. And also integrity doesn't have anything to do with condition. For instance, the Ramaji building has wonderful integrity, but it's falling apart. You can have buildings that have been totally remodeled and in great shape and have no integrity. Yeah. So it's integrity to their period of significance. Yeah, there would have to be some definition of integrity. There's pages of definition of integrity, but, it, oh, but right. I would put it in the ordinance so you can use it, uh -huh. so that it becomes a tool. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I think that's, that's great. Um, and so we would add that to our section C, right? item four because it's already handled if they've already been listed. We don't need to worry about that. Can I just jump in with some other thoughts that are kind of germane to what you're talking about? Um, this is the, what I think you've called the Historic Landmarks Advisory Committee, or you're calling the panel. And I can see you're trying to uh, tread a line between an official advisory committee and just a panel who the planning director can go to. But I think that's going to be pretty tricky because a lot of our, um, to acknowledge that you have a local historic landmarks register, um, it assumes you getting items on that register have gone through an approved CEQA process. And to do that, you need qualification, the Secretary of Interior's qualifications and standards, which is in our 
general plan. And it says that we're going to use that to make these decisions that you need an advisory committee that approximates some of those qualifications. Um, so it seems like you're trying to shy away from having a real advisory committee, and yet you want this register to be used for the Mills Act and to be used for historic building code, which require some system, you know, to put, um, to add properties on there. I, I think I you should think, go for a full advisory committee. I think this panel is only making that initial sort of cut at it and that's why it says or their designee so that they can bring in more expertise as it moves on or require the applicant to hire somebody to dig into all the details if it gets that far well if a project's going in and somebody wants to clear the old ranch site and put in a subdivision and the ranch house and the barn are determined. And then it's going to be under CEQA and it's going to have all that review It'll be anyway. under CEQA. I just so let's think you need, some ex you need some um, expertise. Um, on your panel. On your panel. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you're not following the Secretary of Interior's qualifications which the general plan said we would follow in order to add properties to this. And you don't want to, and it, I mean, you could do that. I don't think you can, you have the planning director or their designee, the chief building official or their designee, the Calavis Historical Society would presumably choose someone. And I would also recommend you add to that list your county archivist. She can find out, they, whoever, in five minutes when it was built. Who built it? Who lived there? I mean, you could just send a request to her, but I would put her right on that initial panel. Otherwise, you're going to be going, well, is it 80 years old or is it only 70 years old? And we'll have to do a research and put the archivist on there. That's, that, that's they do that splendidly. I think that's what we were thinking with the historical society, but. There has already been a list that started yeah. under uh, Gabrielle Elliott. The county archivist did it extensively as she asked me to do certain communities, people all over. It's in your GIS system. It's not definitive. It has to be added onto, but at least it's a huge beginning that went on for almost a year. And that isn't noted in any yeah. of these and, topics. And is that the list you're talking about? Is that the list you're referring to? The one that Gabriel Elliott had the archivist and all of us involved compile? No. This no. Is, as I understand it, this, this ordinance, right? the list gets added to as permit applications are received. There right. wasn't an intent to, for the county to, to pre-list pre -list sites. I understand that that might be desirable, um, but it's not, what I understood the direction from the board was um, in adopting the urgency ordinance and to coming up with the permanent ordinance to replace that. Um, you know, that's certainly an option that the commission and board can consider of, you know, identifying key sites that should be on the list. But these are sites that have already been determined eligible. eligible. They're already... That would be something that we would certainly use as a resource and make a determination if the proposal had a significant effect. Well, the planning, the former planning director had that list drawn up. Do you have a copy of it in the planning department? Yes. So you know there is a list of all the properties in the county that are already listed on the National Register. Shouldn't that have something to do with this list you're talking about? That's what we're saying, that yeah. this will be pre-populated with listed and eligible national or federal mm -hmm. and state previously identified. They were either listed or eligible on those two lists but not necessarily pre-populated by things that somebody here locally has identified as it could be eligible, but there has been no process for, lo for a local listing. So unless it's on one of those other lists, it wouldn't pre-populate our new local list. Is that what you understand, Peter? Yes. Okay, okay. and that list is available. That'll be posted online. So um, people can check to see what's on it. I don't know, but I do. I, I, I want to like 
finish the first part of your thought, which was add the archivist to the panel. Yeah. Okay. How, does everybody feel like that would make sense because they might be able to quickly yep. um, be a filter yeah. on whether something's reasonable or not. And if it, it has been previously identified, it will certainly need further yeah. looking at. Right. So I think good in that is that's what you were trying She's to She's already get. a yeah. county employee. I mean, that's. Yeah. Yes. So I just wanted that simple okay. edit we can that's, take yeah. care of that there's good yeah. agreement on. Okay. And, and before we get into more into procedures, I think we do need to talk about interior versus exterior. Let's so do we second. all agree that we're really looking at exterior components and only on a building that's been determined to be significant and, and eligible for listing or listed? but we're looking at the exterior. We're not trying to limit what somebody can do on the interior. Right, yeah. I, I, I think so. I'm curious to know um, to what extent, if at all, would we be looking at the interior? And I'm guessing that there are some uh, structures, interior-wise, that have this historical significance that, that uh, display the, the period. That, uh, that could be a potential of the proposed modification would include both exterior and interior changes. And if the building were of such significance that the interior really raised that level of the integrity of the historic resource, we might consider conditions on maintaining historic character. Yeah. Um, but I think that would be the rare exception on the most part, we, you know, we don't have a Monticello here. You know, maybe there is the first governor of California might have had a house here. I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. Probably not, but we would yeah. know that already. I, I, um, but one thing we have to, I'm sorry. And if it were in such pristine condition that it was worth protecting to maintain that historic resources, that could be something that would be considered by the panel, the commission, Ultimately, the board. And I was just curious to know whether or not there would be a consideration for that, and you've answered the question. Yeah, thanks. And um, I actually could, have a. Go ahead. I'll the mine is quick. Uh, could we differentiate between uh, residential houses and, say, uh, public or, or government buildings on the interior part of it? Because I can't imagine most residential houses are, are going to have anything inside them, whereas, you know, an old bank or an old government building might. I mean, it. It, again, narrows it down a little bit, differentiating residential houses versus other buildings. I have a suggestion, which was that if something was determined to be of great significance historically on the interior, couldn't we have a requirement to, ha to have those items removed if the person doesn't want them so they could be preserved somewhere else? So say there's a a beautiful bar somewhere and it's you know 150 years old and but they're going to turn this building into something else entirely and there's no way to keep it couldn't we have a requirement that or if a building is going to be demolished entirely that there be the opportunity first to remove any intact historically significant elements that would make sense well that would be the purpose of the review by the panel to make a determination of what what best to do with this, you know, if we're going to prove the the um, demolition because it's structurally unsound, there's other reasons why the integrity is not there. But there are components to it that, you know, that could be something that we, the panel would recommend to the commission as a condition of approval. Um, I, I don't know that we need to. Have it, in have it in the code necessarily because I think there's going to be each one is going to be a unique review, uh, which is why the use permit. Uh, you know, what's special about this particular building or site? Um, what do we need to do to protect those resources to the best of our ability? Um, and it could be, I'm sorry, we can't suggest that you um, demolish this. You need to do something to protect it. Or understand that the demolition is good, but you know, there's this historic bar that's there that you know right. really could be. And then we have the, um, one of the um, provisions of the general plan that said we were going to 
establish criteria for the uh, preservation of, of and, and uh, what's the word? Um, That's what got my attention, the, the, actually. The, the artifact. artifacts. I think that is probably more associated with um, cultural resources. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why I didn't actually include that. But there are several different already existing procedures. There's uh, Caltrans has a, a procedure for doing that. There's another state historical uh, preservation office that has a long list of procedures of how you handle artifacts. Right. Um, and that's why we I need was, to reinvent the wheel on that one. I was um, trying to extrapolate but, but I, yeah. that to things that might be destroyed yeah. as part of a project that we're going mm -hmm. to allow or a demolition we're going to allow, but. Could we at least try to save what can be saved if there's any interest in it or a place for it to go? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a statement in mitigation. And various agencies have different kinds of mitigation. Tahoe Regional Planning Agency, where I work a lot, they have a certain line type of mitigations they approve. Others have different ones. They're federal mitigation. They're all of these. So you need to spell out what you want. For the Royal Mountain King Project here, we did a public popular publication. And you can do saving parts of buildings. You can do any kind of thing you want to, but just have that there so the person knows what is going to happen with your mitigation. That's a whole other piece of, mm -hmm. of <laughs> mm -hmm. I have some comments on it, which is just giving people a heads up of where to look to see what kinds of things they might be looking at. We, I don't we, necessarily think it needs to be built out here, but we need a, a place for people to. Going back to the, the, the actual procedures and what triggers the panel and this sort of thing, um, I think we, we do have to keep in mind, as Mike was pointing out, that the, the, the property owners shouldn't be unnecessarily burdened uh, by this procedure if they don't unnecessarily if they don't need to be. Uh, but so I think this the first decision gets referred to the planning director. Should the planning director also make a determination that the, the whether or not the <laughs> alteration permit would permit alterations to the exterior? And if so, then it goes to the review panel. That, and, and at that point, it, it becomes an administrative or conditional use permit or administrative use permit. Um, that way, if, if we limit it to the exterior at that, or to exteriors at that point, the uh, landowner is not going to have to go through the, the permit procedures. So, you mean if they're requesting interior modifications, right. so that's what he's saying. So if they're all they're going to do is redo their kitchen and they're not going to change the windows in it or anything that would affect the exterior, because is that the an off ramp right right away that they're out of this process, and, even and if the project is determined to be eligible? Um, I think that gets to your initial question of does it apply to interior remodel? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that needs to be clarified in the ordinances. It doesn't, ha doesn't, doesn't say that now. Right. It just has any permit. Well, it doesn't, it, it doesn't say that it's limited to exterior, which I think is what we have to get in there. I think right, that's right. Something that's something we were I, talking about. We're saying about the same earlier. thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, but I think that's the stage where the landowner gets relieved of extra burdens. If it's just an interior building permit, it goes back to they the building official. They don't need an or a CUP. They can just work it out. move along. Yeah. So it, it can be a thing on your checklist. Like pretty soon they're, they're just out. We know they're out. and yeah. doesn't get to the review panel. With, you know, and we don't ever yeah. see it. And related to that, I have the whole thing about whether it's possible to look at the scale and content scope of projects and separate does everybody need to go to a cup if they're doing anything at all or is there a potential for an aup for very limited scope modifications that are clearly would be allowed versus 
uh, a more extensive. Well, that's why I, I suggest that we just have it be an AUP and rely on the planning director's ability to have it considered by the planning commission as a CUP if it appears, if the, the zoning ordinance is quite clear, uh, if it appears to be a subject of uh, public interest and importance, and et cetera, that to put everything into the CUP process Again, I think it overly burdens the uh, to the uh, the landowner. I agree, but I do think anything of more significant scale on a property that is important to the community needs public input. Well, yes, and but I, I, I I'm relying upon the the planning director, current and future. Yeah. To, to exercise discretion in that regard. Well, if we were keeping our planning director, I might yes. think the same yes. way, but, but because I believe we will not forever get to keep our yes. planning director, I think it, we probably need to try to define a, a line, although that's going to be a little bit difficult. Yeah, <laughs> where do you draw that line? And, and I think... That, um, my thought on this is that by the time we get to the point of making a determination that um, it qualifies under B, C, you know, one through four, it's not just the fact that it's 75 years old, but it also meets those yeah. criteria that are established mm -hmm. in state law for essentially eligibility. Um, there, it's going to be significant. Um, and that's why we said CUP because we think that anything that there is going to you know, have that level, you know, raise that level of public interest as well as particularly if the applicant is saying, I don't want to do any of this. It's going to be very difficult for the planning director, you know, as the uh, you know, oh, administrator right. as doing a UP well, process, well, say, well, too bad, you have to do this anyway, and then go through the appeal process. But then can't you do it? in that order so that the review panel is is doing the review before it's classified as a CUP or an AUP and a part of its determination is you no know, this is you know this is a property that qualifies under the applicability standards that's when it becomes a so the way the process is set up is the planning director makes a determination that it is of historic significance that needs to go through this process. It meets one or more of the criteria established in BC um, or B1C, and then it goes to the panel to say, well, what can we do to either allow this project to move forward while maintaining the integrity of the building? Um, or do we get to the point where this is so significant that we just can't recommend that it be demolished or that the design needs to go back for, you know, total redesign to yeah. maintain the character? And that's where it would be kicked up to the Planning Commission for the, the panel makes the recommendation, the commission makes the decision. On I guess it. it's... Uh, I, it's uh, let me sure. describe my project, my imaginary okay. project here. Yeah. Um, in which case, so you've determined it's a city significant structure property and that it is eligible for listing so it's going to go on our our local list but what they're doing is that interior kitchen remodel and as part of that on the back side of the property they want to replace the window over the kitchen sink and take out a section of wall and put in a big folding door so those are going to be allowed under the rehabilitation changes that you know they're not changing the streetscape they're not so and that's all they're not doing anything else so couldn't that be approved as an AUP so that it doesn't require the whole public process because it's not really impacting the public's enjoyment of the property I it seems to me like we could find some some spot where we know that these things would be allowed and 
does it really need a CUP and, and the expense of a CUP yeah. and time consideration? Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess like so. we saw with the little place in Murphy's, you know, where they doing the little addition. Now that was, that one's a little more problematic, but yeah. so that's maybe not a good example. But um, you know, or, or they're replacing all their windows with historically correct windows, but they're modern windows, but they would be allowed under the rehabilitation guidelines. I guess a qu one question is, how far along does this procedure have to go before you label it an AUP or a CUP? Yeah. No, I, I hear it, what you're saying, and, and I think we could probably craft something that provides that sort of in, intermediary step to say what is proposed here, or if you would do this, this, and this instead of what's proposed and they agree to that, that it could be approved administratively and still meet the process um, that we have here. And that's so certainly have to work and with council to figure out how we do that. Their property rather than go, oh, I'm so, we don't want to create the situation we had with our PD. Um, the other uh, thing is to formalize somehow the involvement of the landowner in this process. I mean, right now, the review panel seems to be operating in its vacuum over here without the landowner having any input, which I think. Um, well, I think that sort of this yeah, goes it's by. kind of a given as part yeah. of the process. When does the landowner, if it's, as you envision uh, any redrafting of this, when does the landowner get, he's, he's put in a a request an alternation uh, an alteration permit uh, request. When does he get involved in this system? As he soon as we review it and find that this is triggered by this ordinance. Okay, and then that would then and then the landowner would be told, and this is going to be considered a an AUP or it's going to be considered as a CUP, um, that's when the they landowner would get They have to sign that application. Do they? They have to sign the application and participate in filling it out. So they're going to be involved. Or would it just be deemed to be an application, the permit application be a deemed to be an application for I don't think well, so. Well, when they submit their building permit application, yeah. they have to sign, you know. Exactly. But and I well, think they'll be told at that time, if yeah. your it, building it would is really, more than 75 yeah. years old, it's going to be assessed for these things. It would be no different than yeah. us finding, oh, you don't meet the setback, you have to modify yeah. your building, or you have to apply for a variance. Right. Um, the so same procedure would, would occur, and that isn't necessarily written out in our code. It's just, it's a procedural thing that we have developed over years um, and we tweak it to make it more, as efficient as possible, both for the applicant as well as staff. So how can we get through this process you know, in, as, in an efficient manner? Um, so every application for a building permit from a demolition or alteration would, at that same time, the, the landowner would be notified that hey, this might be subject to this ordinance, right. and, uh, and we'll, we'll be back to you. <laughs> right. Well, it, it's, you submit a building permit, and it's understood that planning will look at it, public works will look at it, environmental management will look at it, the building department will look at it, and you may have corrections. Yeah. And in some cases, we say, you can't do that here because you're not zoned for that use, or you don't meet the height or setback requirement. You need to modify your plan. So of course, we notify the applicant. Or you have so, to fill, fill out an application for an AUP or CUP, yeah, depending so, on what you're and doing. That, and that would, after the, after the review panel would go through its, its process, part of that would be a determination of uh, this is either no further application is required, uh, a, AUP is required, a CUP is required, and at that point, you would request, a, uh, you would ask for a, an application for an AUP or a CUP from the, 
Okay, that's yeah. it's all falling into place. So, sort of the, the same process, as similar to our existing processes as possible. Right. But you keep mentioning, you have in your general plan, all of the Secretary of the Interior standards. That's really simple. You don't have to say anything. Just give them the Secretary of the Interior right. standards, which basically say, if you have wood walls, replace with wood walls. You know, if you have wood windows, replace with wood windows. If you've got spindles, replace the spindles. Yeah. Very, simple. very simple. You don't have to make any of these decisions as long as you say you follow Secretary Sanders. But I want to say, I'm working with the Forest Service for 40 years now. They allow certain things on the uh, away from the critical views of the street, they call it. So additions can be made to the rear of those cabins in all of the forests of the United States but not to the front. So that's, I think, something, because all of those need bathrooms. There were never any bathrooms. So they make them put them on the back. And as long as they put them on the back, this is not a critical view. And it seems to me that's a really simple thing to say. If, if you've got, the thorn house could put, you know, whatever he wants on the back of that, but nobody would notice it going by. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You just that's need a lot nice. more... You need a lot more criteria in here. It's just too vague. It doesn't doesn't tell anybody anything. You've got a I'd, I'd be reluctant. And, and yeah, I don't I, think it belongs that, in the ordinance. I mean, if, I think what Judy's referring to is what Tuolumne County did, where they have all the criteria in their ordinance. Um, and while that could be helpful, I think the other concern is that the criteria should be flexible. And sometimes we get locked into the code and, oh, we can't do that because the code says we can't do that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I would rather have that flexibility. I think our intent is to do exactly what you suggested is that, and I'll give you an example. I owned an 1870 home in, outside of Placerville. And we did an addition to it because the kitchen was about the size of this desk. <laughs> yeah. And so we added the kitchen, we added some you know, dining area, we had, and it was behind the building, so from the street, I mean, you could see the new building, the new portion of the building, but the front looked the same. Mm -hmm. um, and we used modern construction techniques that mirrored the old style of the house, mm -hmm. the wood siding, the tall um, double hung windows. Right. But they were, you know, double panes rather than <laughs> the, the single pane windows that were still in the front of the house because yeah. I couldn't afford to replace those. But, um, you know, and it, it, it worked. I think we can just reference the Secretary of the Interior's documents, which there's two parts online. They're 2017 editions right now, but I don't even think we'd want to say, I just think the current edition, mm -hmm. and, and not repeat those things on our ordinance, but include the direct links to those documents. Because actually the one for rehabilitation is a really great document which is what judy was describing it has really good specific things acceptable unacceptable in tables for a lot of the components so something else i want to mention you keep, you keep using 75 years the law federal law states 50 years the um CEQA states has no time frame. So it just has to meet the four criteria. So if somebody wanted to go in court and say, I've got a 35 year old building and it meets this criteria, they could then get whatever they wanted out of it. And just so that you know that this document does not mirror federal or state law, which we have to work under. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just, if, if you went through this whole process for a project and used the 75 years, which is in our general plan, it wasn't mm -hmm. like you guys made it up, um, and then submitted that process as compliance with CEQA, you might get away with it. But somebody could say, no, you use 75 years and we say 50 years, you have to go back and look at that 25-year um, increment in your project. So you just need to know that. I know it would be drastic to change it, and 50 years always feels like... Yeah. You know, I was 
That's right. Well, 50 years ago. I was here 75 years ago. Depends I know. On your context, yes. But it sounds shocking. But just to know that when you say, and then this will, you know, this process you're doing will comply with CEQA, it won't. We're, we're, we're not saying we're not that. Saying we that. understand that CEQA has its own standards, and any project subject to CEQA has to meet those standards. The CEQA standards. Right, but so there was some for projects that are not subject to yeah, CEQA. For ministerial projects, we, we're going to look at anything older than 75 years old, regardless. Okay. If, if it is uh, a discretionary project and it's going to be subject to CEQA anyway, then we're going to have to use this, the CEQA guidelines to do that. Okay. okay. And the, the general plan itself does talk about uh, prior to demolition of building 75 years of age yeah. or older. So I think we are yeah. stuck so in this ordinance. To be to right, and I, I acknowledge that. The general I acknowledge plan. that, that it's in the general plan. We fought it at that time and lost. And just but bring uh, it up again. We use as much as we can of, of previously vetted documents and criteria because that only makes sense instead of making up our own. So we're not gonna say, oh, we're gonna write our own when we can just refer to the Secretary of the Interior's documents, or these are the agreed upon criteria for what makes a, a project or a property uh, eligible for listing. You know, we're not gonna make up our own criteria. No, that was very smart of you. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's exactly what this says. No, none of yeah. us are. Except where you, business. yeah, so these are things that would not, that are, um, would not be subject to CEQA. These your, your, your list is, in, it's implied that the list, if something is on the list, it has gone through scrutiny that would stand up to CEQA. It applies that this list, your Mills Act applies to it, the Historic Building Code, so it assumes that things on the list. But if things are on the list only to decided by the planning director, in all difference, Peter right. or whoever's in that seat, if they're the only one who decides if it's on or off, do they meet the Secretary of Interior standards? Because that's a requirement for a listing on the register. Yeah, there were, I actually read through the stuff. It seems like it doesn't say anything about CEQA. It talks about the same criteria for it. So whether you're, and the Mills Act yes. is very much flexible um, and can be modified a lot on a local level by the city or county that is enabling it yeah, to actually that. encourage particular kinds of development or discourage other kinds of things. So. Certainly that would be allowable. And it has always been that the historic building code could be applied to a project that is just locally recognized as significant. Yes, okay, good. The Mills Act does require an application on the state DPR form. Yes. And that has to be signed by a um, professional, an architect that can't. And there's a whole contract that goes along with it, which is again, very flexible. Yes. Depending on the yes. local jurisdiction. And the other point the about the- The more you read, the more there's to find out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that it comes out. And so the Mills Act needs to be passed by the Board of Supervisors. You all know this, but so if the ordinance is passed, it still has to come before the Board of Supervisors for them to pass it separately. So we're just hoping that's on your program to recommend that they do that. Yep. Um, it is. And speaking of the Mills Act, at least the way I read it, if it's on a local list, you can make the application for the Mills Act. And so it, it appears that it gives great latitude as to what we put on the local list. It does. <laughs> but it, but it still, it refers back to that, that same list of criteria. It, it's, I had it somewhere. I saved the little section that talks about it. It does refer back to there's some tax code stuff, and then it codifies the requirements in there. And it all circles back to the same information. Yeah. Right. So, right. but um, that's a whole nother level beyond. I mean, the board will have to approve this also. I suggest that we take. Uh, like 10 minute break maybe and come back decide 
let, let, let's get um, back on some sort of an outline of how we're going to approach this. I think probably everybody feels like they have a better handle on where we're at, thanks to you guys. Um, okay. So is that okay with everybody? So should, should we come? I have a couple of more things I hadn't gotten to. Should I do them now or do you want us to come back? Are what? you trying to get out of here? Do you, do you really? Do you not want to spend? You might the day want to be left us? alone too. You might not want us here. <laughs> sure, go ahead. And um, just um, in the proposed, when the planning director reviews the thing and says yes or no, like in the old Coliseum, we're just suggesting you have that potentially eligible. There may be a property that the planning director just doesn't have quite enough information, but not enough to say no and send it on, not with a yes, but with a. Will the panel look at this? It's a potentially, but so it's not so definitive. Which just which I, I had that in my notes too. Oh, you do? Well, I'm <laughs> glad to see that. It's not really a legal term. It's the other is to clarify. I'm hoping that it is true that the county register um, will include all cultural resources, the archaeological sites. That it's not just building and structures. If it's if it is no. our official county register of historic resources, all known cultural resources that are on an existing list, which would include what the general plan defines as cultural resources, archaeological sites, prehistoric sites. I think we could, at the very least, link out to that list, even though. It but might you, you, you mean the, to the list that has all the national register properties? Well, they. Yeah, so those would be incorporated, but you're talking about archaeological sites. But also. that is defined in our general plan as a cultural resource, right. as a historic resource. So if this is a county register of historical resources, we would like it to encompass all historical resources. Or it will just be a county list of buildings and structures, of historic buildings and structures. I'm going to let Peter. So the. Um, uh, that's a, a policy call. The general plan policy says establish a county register of historic resources. Right. Um, and so that's why I was focusing on. We, I mean, Versus it, it, prehistoric. It, it could include or, all cultural resources. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just hoping you will say yes. So this is why I don't want to put I'm you on the spot. How, who's going to keep it up? That's why I'm saying if we could link to some other list somehow so that it, it kind of keeps itself up to date. Well, I guess what I see this list being, since you've got the federal list, you've got the state list, the county list would include all of those already. Mm -hmm. And then it would be perhaps resources that we see at the local level as being important for our local history or our local cultural, um, whatever the word I'm looking for, you know, but may not raise to the level of state or federal importance. Right, but um, I think what she's trying, uh, what? Um, but what, will it include a whole range of cultural resources? Yeah, she's trying to yeah. get, so if we know yeah, no, about other that. cultural yeah. resources, could they be incorporated into this database or? Yeah. Um, I, I don't see any reason why. Um, I don't know what mechanism we would use to add it to the list. Well, that's, um, that's it, it, my question. It's already, these are already on the list that Shannon compiled for Gabriel. Right, but. Oh, look at you, she's throwing up her head. But, but they came from what? From a state list, state and federal. So if they're already on that, they're already on the list. Yeah, so then matter. they'll already be on it. If they, yeah. if it is something that someone said, hey, that's a really cool old building, and that should be protected, and it's not identified on any state or historic or state or federal list, then I think that's the the question that the commission and I would have is how what would what would that mean? Um, how would we? How would you get it on the list? And, well, and what input would the landowner have? Well, yeah, so I don't think that we have, there is no desire um, to unilaterally go out and identify things that are not already on a list as this needs to go on a list. 
Um, so, so when you say they're already on a list, they can't be on the archivist list that, that she shared with Gabriel. Yeah, they are. As, if that's the only place they are, no, they won't become part of this list. But if they are already listed on a state or federal list. That's a separate list. That, this yeah. is a new one that was started last year. Right, so the, the list that was started last year by the archivist at Gabriel's request, right. those will not automatically populate this list, but they will be a reference when looking at anything that comes to the planning department, because that might be the, a clue right off the bat that it's already... Somebody's okay. already looked at it and determined that it's eligible. But also, we're not going to go out there and say, and just have a public list that identifies all these properties where the landowner has had no part in um, right. asking to be listed. Right. Something just, we probably will need to establish. It doesn't need to be established through the um, through the ordinance, but a procedural document that say, okay, how are things added to the list? Yes. We clearly say that those items that come through this process, yeah. the review of demolition permits, get mm -hmm. listed. Or, but a, or, an individual property owner, or maybe something yeah. through a discretionary project. We have you know, a proposal to build a commercial building and there's a historic site, there's, you know, and it meets the criteria through CEQA because we analyze it through that vehicle, we could add it to the list. Oh, a property a owner, owner could, could come ask. and say, you know, I really want to be on this list because I want to take advantage of the various um, building codes and Mills Act mm -hmm. or whatever else, maybe some grant money that by being on a local list would make them eligible for that. Right. So, we, so for instance, we have the design review district in the Columny Hill and we have some 50 properties on it. There are many more eligible. And all of those had property owner consent. We have consent forms from all of them. Just as a bunch, would they be on this list? Would they be eligible? If they would be on the eligible. List, or the, Pardon? If they're on the state or federal list. They're not on the state or federal list. So I'm not talking about the state and federal yeah. list at Shannon. We're talking about that other list that is only no, local. No, yeah. they would not uh, get They would not automatically marked. be put on the list. And how, what would be their process to get on there? Um, well, it says on us. any local list that has been approved, for instance, Tuolumne County has done cultural resources surveys of every community there. So uh, it's once it's on the list, it's on the list, and they can use all of those things. This county has not done that. In fact, I did Murphy's in 1976. One quarter of the buildings are gone. They're disappearing really quickly. So I, no. we would urge you to just have start doing a survey. Well, I think you can get grants to do this. Sort of thing. I think that what's I what's think important there is, is not a will to proactively identify and list properties in the county right now. But we are, Mo Kill is the example. We've done the survey. We've had the but property owners sign those on. Those owners can come and request. request that they be put on the list. That that would be added to this draft, correct? That, that we could put something yes. in there that that identifies how the ways properties in which would to... could be listed. Um, we have to think about how we would do that. It would just yeah. be nice but, to open the door to that because, for instance, the. The County Historical Society could take on as a project to get their members to inventory different communities, right. fill out the forms and turn them in, and it'd be nice to have those houses yeah. included in the list. With the signature. So, I, so I, we're, we're, we're Hill expanding sort of an well outlier beyond the in scope. That they did all already agree to be in that, in that historic district, but that's not true of everybody in the No, rest it's not true, but I'm saying that Calaveras County Historical Society is interested in projects yeah. to promote the county history. And they might rally members, say, in Copperopolis to talk to property owners, form yes. a district, fill out forms. But if they brought that, would they put, could that get on this list? If yes, not, if the, if what's yes. the point? If the property owners requested it, yes, we would have a process. But one at a time, the property owners would come in, or they do it as a group? I well, the, well, there, there is criteria the for this. Because it's the property owner. There um, is criteria for how to do a survey and how it's approved. So we don't have to think about that. It's already established. 
by the Office of Historic Preservation to any survey that has gone through their approval process can be, those are all numbers. But we are not going to put them just because a survey identified them. The property owner has to pro, they have to ask for that. And so if you had, let's say you did do that and you had a survey and you determined there were 12 buildings somewhere and you got the signatures of everybody was on there and they wanted as a group to be added. I'm sure there would be a way to do that, but every property owner would have to individually agree to having their property listed. Well, that's not true of the National Register. No, but they're not. Well, we, we, we understand that. We understand that. We understand that. We understand that. We yeah. We yeah. don't want a group of enthusiasts to add somebody's property without their knowledge. Right. No. No. Yeah. Nobody does. Yeah. We don't either. We're not advocating that. Yeah. I mean, every, These are all signed by the owners. Yeah. But you just don't want it as a group. Well, we're saying if they're a group, but you have the individual signatures of every property owner, then that's, that's what we do have. Why couldn't we do that? That's what I'm just want to open the door to but, augmenting but I think we're this. So far beyond yes. the scope of what well, is before our us our today. Our CEQA analysis for this project is limited to the yes. implementation of two general plan. Amendments exactly. or, or implementation measures. They're actually asking a question about a yeah. specific procedures that will be part of this. It's kind of getting a little further down the road. Thank you. I think the the only item left, and we will get out of your hair, is that demolition by neglect. Yeah, I have that on my list. It's what? <laughs> so we'll do this. There's a, a, a technique where um, a property owner just lets the building deteriorate, the historic barn fall down the Romaji store, the IOF building in Moak Hill, you just let it fall down until it's so far past its prime that they don't, they can tear it down. And that could be pointed out as you can't do that. That's demolition by neglect. Yeah, I, I do have that on my list as something that we need to talk about. But that doesn't necessarily have to be a part of this Ordinance right no, it now. might, and there might be a different I way, but, a but I do on. think we need yeah. to talk yeah. about it a little bit. Yeah, I think we should Anything say, else? I agree. We're done. Yes, I want to say it, it has been an issue. This, but this is a good start, but this not is not a historic preservation ordinance. It's basically a demolition and a conditional use permit ordinance. So we would like to see a preservation ordinance, and we're willing to work on this, that would be approved by the Office of Historic Preservation and satisfy secret requirements. If we truly want to encourage our citizens to preserve our county's valuable heritage, we should assist them in every way to accomplish this. And we should have handouts for them. It's already done, it's a six page document, you hand it to them, tells them where to go for help. We need to do more. This isn't the end all and be all. And we hope that you understand that. That we're going to, we've been doing this for 40 years. We're not going to give up. <laughs> we may die, though. I expect that. Really. Thank you very much for Thank coming you. this far. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. participating. That's right. Okay, let's okay. take a 10 minute break and come back and then reorganize ourselves and see what we can get done today. All right, we are back in session. I think, um, well, Peter, I think you're going to be doing some editing. So are there particular places you want to get good consensus on that we should start with right now? Yeah, I think that the best thing is so the bigger global issues that have been raised here earlier, make sure there's a consensus or at least a majority that says, yeah, this is the direction we want to go. Uh, I think we can maybe go through some of the other more specific issues. Um, I will be bringing back, I think we will probably need to continue this in order to clarify some of the intent of what this ordinance was intended to do. So uh, I don't think we can plan on trying to finalize it today. Yeah. Uh, we'll you know, my recommendation now would be to continue it to the next meeting. And, and in that respect, Peter, I, I don't need to go through every 
suggestion. There are a couple of issues that you raised um, that I think are more policy issues we should discuss. Yeah. But a lot of the little uh, yeah, um, the, the, grammatical the, errors and stuff that I'm doing that. I leave it to you to okay. weigh them and decide whether okay. to do them or not. So um, the bigger issues that I see that we've talked about were um, interior versus exterior. The understanding is this applies to exterior changes only unless the review of the exterior changes uh, identified that the interior is so unique and of the integrity that we need to go into that as far as conditions for uh, a project, but I think that's going to be the exception, rare exception, to the general rule of this is applying to exterior only. Um, but we'll make I'll make some edits and clarify that. And um, would I would think the associated landscape in directly around would be a similar mm -hmm. thing? Yes. Yes. Um, Um, we want to make sure that we refer to the Department of Interior guidelines in our review process, the panel review process. We want to add the county archivist to the panel. I think that was a good suggestion. Um, landscape interior. Um, we are not going to um, preemptively or proactively go out and unilaterally apply land. Um, there probably needs to be some additional language in the ordinance that talks about how sites, buildings are added to the list. And so I'll work on that. Um, Can, do, you, do you want any comments now or do you want to keep going on? Your um, that I think are sort of the big issues that I recall unless I'm missing one that I a too busy listening, didn't write AUP, down. AUP, CUP, minor project versus right. And, full. And uh, applications, I'm talking about additions to the list, mm -hmm. applications by owners. To be well, on the list. Yes, yes, that yeah. would be how you, you might get on right. the list, but I was thinking more of you know the procedural aspects of reviewing the demo or the alteration permits. Um, the AUP CUP issue would need to, um, to do yeah. that. And all that I mull over that a bit yeah. to see how we can. And I, that seems to me to be naturally a conclusion that is reached at the end of the review panel process. Yes, yes. That, that the, the, the initial decision by the planning director is that it's. Uh, uh, I guess what? Just to, that it deals with demolition or exterior alterations. Mm -hmm. um, and what? and um, clarify that relocation would be a form of alteration. Yes, yeah. yes. And adding integrity to as yes. a fourth item under the local register of historic with, buildings. With some sort of reference as to what's meant I think it integrity. means historical integrity as opposed to Structural. Yeah, we we need some sort of reference yeah. to what integrity means. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or we can put it in our terms. All right. Okay. And then I think the item that we didn't talk about was uh, what to do about a listed property that is being allowed to just demolish itself <laughs> right is that something we can deal with now or do you want to wait on i would need to talk to the building official to see what um and julie and i'll need to also mull over that one a little bit to see how we might um, apply provisions that would prohibit someone from just letting a site deteriorate to the point where it has to be demolished. Um, I know that is an issue that has been raised by a member of the public regarding the train depot. Um, and, you know, you've got a lot of old historic structures that are, you know, they're not maintained, they fall down. Um, but I, I'm not sure I, I, I... Even with not historic, not listed buildings, it's a problem. 
mm -hmm. where landowners just allow something to become a hazard, but it just seems like in the, in this issue, it's not recoverable. You can't just tear it down and replace it. Right, right. Um, yeah, I, I can't quite grasp how we would mandate a property owner to maintain a structure. If, yeah. if it's, and, but that, that's essentially what we're asking. If there is, how, how can we do that? Yeah, I, 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 the problem is a problem, but man, mm -hmm. how do you do it? I mean, yeah. I'm yeah. going to say, you're going to make them pay to fix something they don't want to fix? Well, unless it's, it's a safety issue itself. Yeah, that's, that's I mean, that is, and, and that's where the building department would come in if right, there's so a, an unsafe building. Will do something if it's unsafe, mm -hmm. but if it's just has a hole in the roof or there's squatters in it, that's a whole nother. Mm -hmm. And you're allowing it to just yeah, the windows are being broken. I, there's yeah, different things I, like I that. Don't, I, I don't think we have to deal with that at this point. Yeah, uh, right. how? all of that stuff to do with the attractive nuisance and having people break into windows is already something that is enforced through code compliance. So I think you would be limiting yourself to a discussion of whether you want to impose a, an additional duty on private property owners to fix a property. I actually think that that might be a complicated thing to ask yeah. legally. It must Even have been tried somewhere else, and we might find that. I'll I'll reach out to my colleagues throughout the state and see if you know what they have. If there's anything that they can, you know. But I think that Julie's. I, I know that Julie's right. It's going to be very complicated, oh, yeah. and I think that it's it's um, wrought with short of doing any problem. I think no, it's no. it's the kind of thing that we. Um, See, it's hard to enforce through code compliance and it can get dragged out so long that it might not matter. But I, I think I, I suspect that if that the reason why the existing state and federal law does not require automatic protection, even if you're eligible for listing, is because they discovered it was legally complex to force a property owner to yeah. fix the building. So I don't, so, uh, or, or certainly the state of California would have already <laughs> been requiring and putting an affirmative duty on them to do that. So. Well, it gets down to seizure of property without uh Yes, right. that's right. Well, that's seizure, but it has to. No. If the issue is yeah. whether it would be a regulatory taking. The issue is whether they had a prior vested right to not have to. I mean, there's there's yes. things. It's about something about the character of the property. They're not asking to develop the property. Right. It's something they're not asking that they are ready. Anything. They're not asking for anything. Right. So I. My recommendation and my also sense of the Board of Supervisors is that we shouldn't go there, but that's a, a policy call if you want to explore that. I'd say we wait. We, we take care of this business first. Uh, plenty of other things to do without doing a lot of research on something yeah. speaking, we, we can't of, address. Speaking of safety, and one suggestion I made in here is that if the panel decides that uh, it can't be mitigated, et cetera, where the permit will be denied, I think we do need to have a consideration of safety in that, mm -hmm. in that determination. You know, that, and that's you know, denied to the extent not required. Well, and that's why the building official is involved sure. in this review, because you know, that's, that's yeah. going to be a criteria, obviously. Yeah. I do think the big issue is regulating property owners who are asking us for nothing and it's a static thing that was on the property probably before they bought it. And whether we can force them to fix that thing for historic purposes without compensation, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that would take a lot of research. I'm thinking of a situation in which somebody asks for a demolition permit oh, at, okay. and is told no because it, it okay. and now it is a listed. That's a different situation. Thing. So, yeah. and they willfully allow things to happen that will mm -hmm. result in the building becoming, a, you know, a total loss or or taking it beyond. It won't have integrity any longer. Yeah. So, anyway, it's. I think it is more complicated. I just think it's something we can't just completely ignore because we see it happening all over the place. Yeah. And, it seems you know, like something that has to go to the public. I mean, it, it's the public's interest to 
say, a you know, historic building, the public's got to get together, like these ladies that were here, and start fundraising, and hopefully the landowner will say, yeah, go ahead and fix it up. Well, I'm, I'm, ta I'm not, not even talking the about requiring them to fix it up. I'm talking about requiring them to repair a hole in the roof. Well, instead of yeah. just allowing it to mm -hmm. continue yeah. to deteriorate, well, not doing work. They were made before building codes, and they're not really not great. So they fall but, down easy. Right, but people have <clears throat> managed to keep them up for all this time. So if, if, I'm not talking about requiring them to rehabilitate that building and make it beautiful again. I'm just talking about cut off the damage, yeah. you know. To Arrested decay. Exactly. I was going to say, yes. just like that. Uh, that Bodhi. That Bodhi, right? <laughs> yeah. state of Keep it in decay a state of arrested work. decay. That's okay. Okay. Was there any topic? <laughs> so you guys had well, that I'd, you I'd like to bring up? I'd like to quickly go through, but not point by point, the suggestions I made. Um, I did feel that by putting uh, a lot of stuff under applicability. I think I think having further subsections for determination review and Mills Act applicability and uh, uh, that sort of thing. That. But in, in doing that, I noticed that I have two sub subsection Ds. So don't rely, <laughs> the, don't rely on my letter. <laughs> we, we will <coughs> make sure we have the... Um, it, the I'm now looking at my my suggestions on, on page two. Then it looks as if uh, this under the determination and review, um, this, the planning director shall be responsible for determining whether a building or structure meets the criteria. That really is going to be a part of the later procedure. Yes. So we probably don't need this. Um, Oh, I, after I did this, I noticed that when, let's see, it was a former subsection D, uh, prior to issuing, issuing a demolition permit or building permit for an alteration of a, and you needed building or structure hmm. instead of just structure. See where I am? Your former D. Addition, under additional review required for demolition and alteration of Number one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was D1. Yes. Uh, and whether you're, you're going to have to play around with when you say listed or not listed, because they're not listed now until you determine that they right. will be. Listed or eligible uh, pretty yeah. much everywhere. And then I think I think conceptually we're set on what the uh, what the basic procedure should be, um, and uh, I just if you could just take into account what I have uh, suggested, and if you think it's good, have it reflected in your redrafting. I won't Certainly take up a bunch of time. Now. Okay. Yeah, no, a lot of these suggestions made sense. Um, there's some things I'll need to do some more research on and um, clearly clarify the procedural um, discussion that we had earlier. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did want to comment on one thing. It's on Tim's page four. It's at the top three. And it, I do believe that the, his, the building code applies because you could have partial or selective demolition. And so it does need to remain in there in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand. You have, the, I mean, there's the state historical. The demolition doesn't mean the entire building will be demolished. Selective demolition allows partial demolition and you still would use the, the building code as the part of that. Historical building code. 
the yeah, it's a historical oh, building. Okay. But the, the historical building code just replaces the building code yeah. on listed or eligible buildings. Mm -hmm. right, right. Yeah. Is there is it okay to not add the word negative before potentially significant? Well, I, I just. You know, you can have positive impacts and you have negative impacts. I didn't know it was It's necessary. a term of it art that's used okay. in so Sequan that says impacts means yeah. it's that's fine. a bad impact. That, that was really <laughs> or, freezing the question. Yeah. Or an fine. impact that could be good in some ways but is antithetical to the preservation of the mm -hmm. historic element. Okay, anyhow, fine. Don't, don't worry. And then are you okay with referencing the additionally the additional sections of the revenue and taxation code? Oh, good. Uh -huh. yeah. That applied yeah. because it, I, I was surprised that there was that it seems like most of it's done on the assessor end, and there's a whole bunch of other definitions yes. and requirements that if anybody is interested in the Mills Act, they're gonna want to be aware of the whole kit and caboodle because it's a lot more well, complicated. Yeah, on her know. end. Yeah. And I think like, references to any of the documents, like the guidelines, mm -hmm. that little section that references the tax code and the Mills Act, if we could provide those actual links, that would be fantastic. And um, I know Julie has some great language we can use for uh, the local register of historic buildings um, that that this ordinance can establish the list. Yeah, I didn't realize that, the, I guess the hang up was it makes it sound like a future act, like mm -hmm. shall establish, yeah, right. and we can just say it does establish, or this is, this is that's it. fine. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. And I would think that we want to say places rather than buildings, since we are saying that it could potentially encompass an area around, a limited area around the building. Do we want to say sites for that? I, I guess I'm wondering they, if... That it's used in other places. Okay. Yeah, yeah that, places. That's is, how I picked it. Mm -hmm. It's not a word I'd have come up with. Because I guess I, the, the question is, that there's, a, there's other types of cultural resources that are not historic resources, like somebody died here, but there's no structure. You know, so are we trying to capture all of those here? Because I, I, I was under the impression we were only trying to pick structures and then whatever is surrounding the structures that is integral to the integrity of the historic structure. Does that, you see what yes. I'm saying? Because yes. there's a whole other list of cultural resources and I'm trying to figure out how much we're trying to encompass here. Because the analysis here for within the scope of the EIR was limited to that those two implementation measures. I'll leave it to you guys to figure it out, but in some of these, uh, it, like it's called the National Register of Historic Places. Mm -hmm. That's the terminology they use, so that's how I picked it. The, I guess if we want this list to be expanded potentially, in the future, potentially expanded in the future you know we could call it that now we could put in a a provision that says you know that describes how um beyond this ordinance places and buildings um can be um, added to it um, i don't have a problem with that and i don't think that would extend it beyond the scope of um our sequel analysis but yep. we'll talk about that and, and I mean, make sure we... I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, they've identified other cult other things that are bona fide mm -hmm. cultural resources for purposes of CEQA, but I don't know that we're trying to implement all of that into an ordinance. No, but that's the National Register is... Is a yeah. call the, of the bill, puts the buildings on the register oh, of places. Historic places. Yeah. So, I mean, even if we separated it out, I think, which... Mm -hmm. Peter saying, and you know, California calls it the Register of Historic Resources yeah. because it's a bigger list too. Mm -hmm. But I, I think we could just say right now this is primarily buildings. If we're talking about, and if you look at that, what's on yeah. the state list, it includes a number of sites. Right. There used to be a town there. There used to be a structure right. there. But, but we're not. We're not. Down, we're right. not trying to do that here, but. 
it could be something that could be used in the future. Right. And I wouldn't mind having the language flexible enough so that it could just be added and have to go back and amend Even if it's code. separated So should we call sections. it resources? I mean, we'll, we'll play with that and, and see if we can. If, 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 we, if we do say re register of historic buildings, I think we need to say and structures because throughout this, they're treated as two different yeah. things. I guess the question is, will the person looking at the ordinance think that it goes beyond yeah. into other cultural resources that we're not trying to regulate through this ordinance, even though they might come up in CEQA? Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's just my I'm thought. a fan of places, which, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that, because resources, well, I don't know. I could make an argument every which way, so <laughs> I'll, I will be okay with whatever you guys decide. Peter will figure it out. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah we, um, I'm just looking at our uh, the definitions in the zoning code and we define building and structure separately. So it probably makes sense to include buildings and structures and structure. every time we do that. Uh, sort of a global inclusion there. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is. <laughs> is a building something for humans? Are you, versus Peter? The definite building includes other, not just humans. Um, it says animals or things. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> inclusive. It yeah. Uh, it could be like a water tank or something like that. Yeah. Structure. So I think it's. There you go. That's the definition. Cell towers. Maybe there's a historic cell tower somewhere from, <laughs> from when the aliens came and built it. <laughs> Telegraph one. Out of stone. So are we ready to... Well, let's, let's let Peter do his writing here. Um, are you going to be able to do all this and get... Yes. Should, should we wait until the meeting after next? To Don't say yes too quickly. <laughs> no, no. You yes, have a yes, I, yes, I will be here to wrap this up, is what I was saying. <laughs> um, I think the best course of action would be to um, continue this... Uh, to the next meeting, um, and we'll bring back a revised um, version for you. And what else is likely to be on that agenda? We're <laughs> hoping the hotel project in town. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why I said don't say yes to you. Do you have enough seats in the room? <laughs> Did, is there a way, I mean, Life is a lot simpler if we don't have a room full of people with varying opinions, but I get the impression that even though we're following the legal requirements for notices of these meetings, um, like, I would think there would be a lot more people here. Is there a way to have the enterprise clued in as to when something is or do you, or or establish a communication with them so they call you if there's something that's that's going to be um, prominent. I mean, the hotel that option is out there for them. They just don't. I mean, there has been such a revolving door of local yeah. political yeah. Uh, writers that um, you know they just don't seem to maintain. I mean, we've had uh, in the ten years that I was here. Um, there must have been a dozen different writers that I worked with over over the years, and just yeah. I could just cycle through and then move on to some other they paper. Don't, they just don't seem to be aware of governmental issues mm -hmm. that are coming up, and yeah. uh, you know the public participation is actually a positive thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we do our best. We have it online. We have um, you know as much access as people are interested. I just I think you're right that. Um, unless it directly affects them, too much going on in life yeah. to bother showing up at a hearing. But this, today, this would directly affect a lot of people if they really yeah. were aware of it. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, that's true. I think it, in the end, it won't end up affecting that many properties. I mean, when we look back on what mm. we see, I'm not sure that it's... Well, yeah, I'm... I'm I look but forward, it would be a surprise to somebody. I look forward to redrafting. I think it's going to make a, a whole lot of sense and, uh, and be fair. 
And we're likely to have a lot more public listening to us here at next time if it is a combined. Uh, so we'll probably put it at the end of the agenda. <laughs> Because I think the people that will hear for it, you know, the, whatever's on the rest of their regular agenda will want to hear their project first, and then we can get into this. But um, if they'll see it on the agenda, if they want to stay for it, they can. Mm -hmm. But even those that are really interested, you know, they had their say, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to stay to hear what the deliberation might be. So, uh, so yeah. maybe you can lead the public to a hearing, but you can't make them stay. It's <laughs> <laughs> an old adage, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, and and there was the opportunity for online comment, and there was nobody. So. Oh yeah, no, I mean yeah. the opportunity's there technically. And I had worked with a little subcommittee, just of you know advocates mm -hmm. to get some early on ideas, and I let them know. I you know say here's a link to the proposed ordinance. The hearing will be this date. Yeah, Judy was the only one that was on that committee that mm -hmm. showed up. So yeah, yeah, well that's. I'm glad you did up. that. <laughs> I showed up. That's right. I mean, you were on the <laughs> but you had to. <laughs> I, I know. Okay. I think we have a consensus on that. I think we, unless so somebody we need has a motion anything to, to add, continue? we should move on to. Commission. Well, I think we need a motion to continue. Oh, yeah. yes, that's right. I move we yes. continue to the next regularly scheduled meeting. This. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 401. Now it's time for commissioner reports. I don't have anything to report. I, I just, this last, because I guess of Columbus Day, the packet wasn't mailed on Tuesday, so I got it on Wednesday. And if there's, I know there's the, the, you put, as I understand it, you put stuff in into the county system on Friday, but it doesn't get mailed on, it often doesn't get mailed on Friday. Is there a way to try to make sure it does get mailed on Friday? Um, we can try, but the mailroom does, it has its own schedule. A uh, part of it was we were working on some last minute things and through various vacations, we were scrambling at the end uh, uh -huh. to get it done. So it was partially our fault for getting stuff late to, um, to Annette. Uh, okay. In fact, I think some of it didn't actually get to her until Monday or Tuesday. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> I subscribe to the planning department's emails, so I get a little notification whenever they post stuff and mm -hmm. I just go get it download it to my computer and start reading it there. Yeah. But you have to have internet, which is you know, up in two yeah. branches. Yeah. <laughs> Does your cell phone work <laughs> <coughs> at home? Oh, my cell phone, yeah. yeah. And right yeah. now, uh, our, our computer is on the blink, but we've got a substitute <laughs> computer. You know, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting process. But yeah, I'm, I'm you know, it's nice to have stuff in, uh, in that you can write on. That you can write on. Yeah. And I oh, yeah. <laughs> like to avoid using my own copier when I <laughs> can. Okay, that's all. Anything else from the commissioners? Just the comment I made really before we started that the four, four horse ranch thing is I'm not done with. We have a use permit application that we're reviewing right now, and we're still working on it. Yes, that will end up on our agenda, I'm pretty sure. So, planning director reports? Well, <laughs> next week is my last week as the interim planning director. <laughs> we have hired a new planning director. I think uh, you will like him, uh, the interview panel was very impressed with um, the applicant. Uh, the greatest thing was that he wasn't looking for work, but when he saw the position open, he decided he wanted to apply for it. So it's not someone who's just here because, you know, I need work. He, he wants to work here. So he will start on November 4th, will be his first day of work here. Um, the board has created a special projects administrator position 
which I have accepted temporarily, <laughs> to finish up things like this Thank ordinance, <laughs> short-term vacation rental ordinance, and perhaps the um, uh, Copperopolis community plan. What about greenhouse gas? Greenhouse Our gas, place. I'm going to pass a baton on that. <laughs> I will give him as much information as I have been able to ferret out. Um, and uh, that will have to be, um, his name is Brett Sampson, and we're really excited. And uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll work closely together, even though I'm moving out of the planning department uh, building because there's no room for <laughs> me there. <laughs> Where are they putting you? I'm going to be over in the little house that used to be uh, Human Resources. <laughs> All right. Um, promotion. <laughs> and where, where is he coming from? Um, he was working for a private consulting firm, happened to be the... Um, uh, firm that we hired for our general plan EIR, but he worked in El Dorado County before that, the city of Rancho Cordova. He's been sort of in and out of the public and private sector, primarily in the private sector where they would contract with the community for um, planning services. So uh, he's got a lot of community planning background. Really good. Okay. So back to uh, Commissioner's report. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we really yeah. needed this. Well, <laughs> your your contributions. At, at You're welcome. I hope I did a decent job. Um, you did. <laughs> and we got some things done. Yeah. And some things moved along. Moved, yeah, some things moved along. I know I probably made some promises to the board that were a little optimistic, <laughs> to say the least. For a part-time job. <laughs> when they say by the end of the year, you didn't say which year. <laughs> true, <Yeah>. true. <laughs> um, but, um, so I'll still be around and, and I'll be presenting you know, some of these other items. But um, I won't have to deal with the day-to-day -day operations of planning department activities. So that'll yeah. free up my time to focus on some of these other projects. And if there's something that I can help Brett with on you know, other things like the oak ordinance or the greenhouse gases, you know, happy to do that. Great, great. It's very I'm encouraging. Fine. And I'm sure your successor is pleased that <laughs> he, he indicated he was pretty happy that I was going to be Good. still available for yeah. So will you still be here part time? That's my intent, yeah. Okay. So good. All right. And we're actually gonna be in good shape. In great shape. <laughs> yeah. Then on that happy note, it is noon. We are adjourning two oh, hours earlier than I had anticipated <laughs> <Me too. laughs> today. I'm very, very